with this, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the first session, inshallah. So today we're extremely, extremely honored to have um, Professor Mohammed Saad uh, with us. And uh, Professor Mohammed Saad sent me a, a very long CV that I'm gonna, not going to do justice to, so I'm going to try to keep it short. <laughs> so he's a professor, professor of innovation and technology management at the business, uh, Bristol Business School. Um, um, he was previously head of school of uh, operations and information management, uh, also at the same school, University of West of England. Um, mashallah, the Palmeiras is amazing. You've been, you've worked in the uh, uh, University of Science and Technology in Wuhan. You've um, you've worked in as a senior lecturer in in Brighton University, then moved on to University of West of England. You lead a very active research. He does a very active research team that works on systems uh, of innovation. Um, uh, and his research activities span many fields, uh, mainstream operation management, innovation and technology management, more global policy uh, related is to issues of um, knowledge development uh, and transfer, and um, an amazing re research track record, 150 publications uh, in many international journals. Um, let's say one million pounds of of funds for research uh, since 2000. That's, uh, that's absolutely an, an, uh, an amazing achievement. He's also co-founder and editor of the International Journal of Technology Management and um, Sustainable Development. His current research is focusing on key determinants of the process of knowledge exchange and the vital role of the university within a system of innovation. This is going to be the subject of the talk today with uh, a particular twist, um, twist on Algeria as a case study. So, welcome, Professor Mohamed Saad, and I'll leave it to you. Let me just give you this. Is there, is it possible? Thank you. I better sit down, because if I start walking, I think I will make it. Well, it's good to see that there is only probably one person who's got gray hair here, who can probably be put in my category of people. <laughs> Uh, as, and it's good to rest, to see that the rest is actually you know, new and lively generation coming, lively generation of Algerian uh, academic coming. Uh, I think operating here, thinking about Algeria, but as uh, Dr. Osama has mentioned, I think as soon as we are involved in research, I think we are, to some extent, global actors. If you publish a paper, or if you are teaching, uh, um, I don't think you have only British students in your, uh, in your, probably British students are, are probably the minority, and you are dealing with an international, if not a global, a global uh, audience. Um, I must thank and congratulate uh, Nasser. I must say that I wasn't aware of what they are doing, and I'm very impressed. I wish you all the best. Um, and without any ado, I'll probably move to my topic and say why I'm doing this topic. I think the advantage of getting closer to retirement makes you feel like doing what you like and what you have, or what you have in your heart and you want to develop. I didn't start my career with the role of university. And I didn't start innovation. I came to innovation by accident. By accident to some extent. I think as a young student, and I'm talking about early 70s, if not late 60s, in Algeria we were all impressed But what we saw at that time was a program, a program of economic and industrial development Taking it, taking it, taking us to, at that time we were saying that by 1980 we will be, we will move from being an underdeveloped country to a developed country. And that was done, that was supposed to be done through the uh, huge investment on the acquisition of advanced technology. We all believed in it, we were all very proud of it, but by mid-70s, if 
not even kind of, you know, before we realized that it wasn't working. And people were starting to talk about why is the technology transfer failing. And that's what really pushed me to research. I came to, to this country in 1979. 80, 90, sorry, 1977. I still remember it was the 9th of January. It was very cold. Uh, after I finished my MSc, I went to Algeria and I thought. And then in 86, I came back and I wanted really to do a PhD <coughs> in, this, in technology and trying to understand why it has failed. I met a professor who was my supervisor. He was very good. Uh, when I gave him my outline, one page he said, he said, oh, Mohammed, very good, very interesting. But what you have here can be done in 10 PhDs. Can, be can you be more focused? So I tried to be focused. And then he said to me, it's true. At that time, most of the studies on the transfer of technology was done at a macroeconomic level, at a national level. And I wanted to do it at a micro level or at an organizational level so that I can actually measure the impact. You know, is it working? It is not, is, is, isn't it working? If so, why? If not, why? So he actually pushed me to look at the theory of innovation. And I used the theory of innovation. That's how I discovered the theory of innovation. I started like, Probably most of us, or most who came uh, here uh, during that time, very often we had to start things from scratch. And I was very fascinated. I'm still very fascinated by innovation. By innovation, I look at innovation from a management point of view. Now, when I was given a chair in innovation and technology management, there were uh, members of the committee who said, we can't give him a, a chair in innovation. Because he's not an expert in innovation. I, I said to them, I, I never pretended, or I never wanted to pretend that I was an expert on innovation. I'm working on innovation management, and that's another thing. So working on innovation took me a few years, if not more, to realize that to innovate, well, to survive, you have to innovate. We need to innovate to survive. But also to innovate, we also have to continuously learn. I mean, I am pleased to watch this program on Bonjour Algérie or on, on uh, 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 the, the, the other channels in Algeria where they bring to us very intelligent people who actually develop things. But it's very important to make a distinction between innovation and invention. Innovation is actually what works, what brings value. Innovation is a new idea that is successfully implemented and help you solve or address a situation. And invention is beautiful. You know, you need to be extremely intelligent, but your invention may just stay on the shelf. It has to, it has to serve a purpose. If it's not serving a purpose, it's not an innovation. So learning is becoming very important. And then through the years, and through maybe the difficult situation that most economies are going through, and therefore most universities are going through in terms of resources, I also started recognizing the role of education in the production of knowledge. So if we want to innovate, we need to constantly create knowledge. Who create the knowledge is essentially the education sector. The education sector play a key role in the innovation. And that's how I also came to, uh, to the role of university. So I thought it was important that I start with this kind of history. So it's, it's I think, you know, we are all uh, involved in the thinking if we, if we say we are, I'm thinking, I'm assuming that you are all academics. We are all kind of pushed to sort of, you know, uh, play a key role in what the university is supposed to, 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 to deliver. So, 
Yeah. Or there is a consensus as to the role of university. To the role of university, maybe I will make some distinction to the role of university in the development of the innovation capacity of a country or the innovation capacity of, uh, of an organization. So this is why policymakers in both developed and developing countries are really trying to s sort of, you know, see how they can get the best out of their universities. In the case of developing countries, although there are some, you know, good stories coming from, from developing countries, but in, the, in developing countries like Algeria, there are many barriers and challenges as to this to the new role or the role of university sometimes, you know, and maybe we should talk about the new role, especially in the UK and even in Algeria, you know, the new role of, of university. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain later on why I am talking about the new role. So there are some barriers, some issues and challenges to do with, you know, governance, with institutions, with culture, with credibility, with you know the existing or the, the existing capabilities, there are issues and challenges, many issues and challenges in developing country that we need to to take into consideration, and we will come back. That's if you want the kind of question that I will try to address you know, during this half an hour, hopefully, talk. But. Although we need to be critical as to the concept of innovation, but there is a large consensus. There is a very large consensus as to what, in what or why innovation. Innovation is, to some extent, widely accepted to be a key factor you know, to growth and prosperity. What I would like to say, unlike the previous and traditional schools, we are not talking only about economic growth. There are different types of innovation, and there are different types of innovation which can lead to also social well and well-being of a society. So any type of new idea, new initiative, new way of doing things, big or large, that can help the society or the individual or the group or the factory or the teaching, whatever. So there is a consensus that actually if you don't innovate, you are more likely to disappear. You know, Schumpeter, who was one of the first ones to start working on innovation, said to businesses, you innovate or die. So it is you know, a means of development you know, from the point of view of economy or social. If I say, you, you can, we can be, I mean, you know, you, we can be critical towards the concept of innovation because we always define it as a new, a new idea. So it has to be new, you know, new to the context, new to the customer, new to uh, uh, the, the production line. It has to be new, but successfully implementing and helping to address a situation or improve a situation. <coughs> So the implementation is quite key. You know? That makes a difference between innovation and invention, or innovation and, and the new idea. I suppose you know that better than I do, that you know, in, you, in, in research in lab or in R&D department, etc., not all ideas which are kind of put forward, you know, which go through this, the, the famous fan, uh, panel, you know, not all of them become innovation. It's actually less than 10%. That's why we, we need to really, I see you know, knowledge and creativity as the suppliers of innovation. We need to constantly produce new knowledge and new ideas in order to you know, make it in terms of, 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 of innovation. So here I'm presenting three types of definition, but in my teaching I like using the definition of Michael Porter because he, he helps us to sort of you know, to look at innovation from different perspectives. You know, we, in our way of, you know, in, in, in our life, to some extent, we have to innovate in order to, 
to exist, to survive, to deal with things. We, ha we need to think about new things and apply them. So the, for a very long time, we thought about innovation only from a technological point of view and only from a radical point of view. But in fact, there are technological, organizational, strategic, politic, organizational, etc. innovation. And there are also different types of innovation. You've got the radical one, which requ uh, requires huge investment on R&D, but you also have the incremental one. Now, that's where small and medium enterprise, small organization, you know, so individuals are also trying to, to develop. So you've got the technical and the non-technical innovation. But in, once again, coming back to the knowledge, I would like also to say that a lot of organization, even those organization which are spending a lot of money on R&D, are also trying to get idea from their staff through different forms of creativity process, suggestion boxes or any kind of tool, tools of creativity. We are not looking at innovation as only coming from the expert you know, who work on R&D, in R&D department. We are now looking at innovation coming from anybody who can bring a new idea and can help improve a situation. <laughs> so, as I said, I think I, 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 I prefer the, the, the portal's definition just to make, 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 make an emphasis on the different types of innovation. Just to make the case, I mean, I'm, it's probably getting a bit older, this reference, but innovative companies are actually found to be, on average, twice as profitable as the oldest. So it's a must. Innovation is a must. What I also like to say, that innovation is also the productive use of knowledge. Without knowledge, you cannot innovate. It's really the basis. It's really the foundation. And, and I like, I put, I put this in, a, in, in this kind of figure just to sort of, you know, put the idea through. You know, the, 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 the context in which we are living has changed from the 40s and the 50s, where business was seen as being predictable. Nowadays, it's very difficult to be predictable. You can't de predict, you know, the, the environment is very uncertain. It's complex, keeps changing. And the way to manage change, because it doesn't mean that because it is too complex, too dynamic, that we cannot manage. No, we have to manage. But we know, when we manage, it, we have to use our brain and to think out of the box. So the way to manage change is really to innovate is to bring new, new and relevant ideas which can help you address that, those changes. And the way or the basis to innovate is learning, is acquisition of new knowledge. I mean, there is, um, there is now uh, uh, a concept. The authors are known as Levin and Cohen. They were, yeah, Levin and Cohen. They were actually working in the 80s and 70s on on technology transfer, and they put forward a new concept which is known as the absorptive capacity. And that absor concept of absorptive capacity is increasingly being now recognized, uh, used as the condition for the development of the innovation capacity. So what is the absorptive capacity about? Is actually, basically, in simple words, is actually what an organization, and maybe the individual, the, the individual as well, you know, what an organization accumulate in terms of knowledge, experience, and expertise throughout all its trajectory, throughout, throughout all its life. This really means that you can't take shortcut. You have to accumulate knowledge, expertise, etc., in order to reach a level that can enable you to develop your innovative capacity. And this absorptive capacity is increasingly being used by the expert on innovation, the, lit the, 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 the literature on innovation to suggest how to go about developing innovative capacity. And I'm currently working on a European project uh, uh, on how to help SMEs improve their innovative capacity in the southwest of England 
on, you know, in, uh, with SMEs working in advanced engineering, and I'm using this concept in order to measure, because the concept is about, this uh, concept, uh, uh, concept of absorptive capacity is divided into four or five capacity. The first one is actually the capacity to acquire the, you know, to, to, to acquire the new knowledge, the capacity to assimilate this language, the capacity to transform this knowledge, and the capacity to exploit this, this knowledge. So knowledge and learning, I'm trying to really put the, the, a greater emphasis on this concept as a basis for innovation. What about uh, the role of, I talk, I use the, the, the term higher education or university to really mean the same thing. Um, but I'm not talking about education in general, I'm talking about higher education. It's, um, I think, the role of, the role of education in general or the role of higher education in more particularly has always been recognized as important in the supply of human capital. And, you know, human the supply of human capital and skilled and qualified people. And that um, supply of human capital is actually being seen as a way to, uh, to develop the economy of, of, of a country. There is no more, I think, um, we are being more demanding to some extent within the new role of university as to the type of knowledge. We're starting talking about the useful knowledge, the relevant knowledge. Uh, there are uh, some colleagues from SPRU, uh, from Sussex University in SPRU, and the name is, uh, one of them is Gibbons, who actually developed a new concept. He, he called it mod, no, mod 2 knowledge. And mod 2 knowledge is, is this uh, knowledge which is useful, which is contextualized, which is pluridisciplinary, this type of knowledge that can help the industry or the society to solve its problem is actually becoming the type of knowledge that university needs to be more engaged in its creation. But we can come back on that and we can be critical because it doesn't mean that we have also to run away from rigor, from theory, from basic uh, uh, things, etc. But there is a call for the university to be more kind of aware of the need in its research as well as in teaching to produce so some a, a type of knowledge which needs to be con contextualized. The role of universities or the position of universities has or is also being presented as having evolved. The first one is known as static, where actually the government was in lead of everything and the university or the higher education was essentially, or in some contexts, is essentially dependent on the state. The second one is the laissez-faire, when we started thinking, let's give to the university more autonomy. And each of, co each of this um, stage, or this role or, or position, has got its pros and the cons. The second one is the laissez-faire, autonomy to the university. But this autonomy of univers to university in the 70s and 80s actually has led to universities doing what they like doing. Uh, and sometimes it's actually reinforced the ivory tower position, where just doing things, you know, theoretical, uh, very academic, based on rigor, but not so much related to, to the industry. And the third one is, you know, we can call it a, as hybrid, or there are people who are calling it the entrepreneurial university. And as I said, you know, I personally got mixed feelings about it. Uh, and I always probably hide behind the, uh, old Alg the Algerian or saying, and in fact, you know, 
that's what reality is about. It's actually about a trade-off between different things. It's a trade-off be be between, between different things. Each, each um, role has, has its pros and the cons. A lot of, especially the author um, of, you know, the author who's, who, who proposed that, for, 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 for this author, all university need to be at one stage or another. This is also wrong, because in a system, we need diversity. We need diversity. Depending just from one system doesn't help. There is a need for diversity. And higher education or education in particular needs diversity, and we can come back on that as well. There is also another description as to the role of university, which is more or less similar. And it's true that universities have first been put forward, developed, in order to provide teaching. So teaching, only teaching, were, is presented as being the first mission. And then moving to teaching and research was the second mission. And here, teaching, research, but also commercializing our research and our teaching. Because it's true that we, in, at university, we produce a, a, a big number of ideas, but what do we do with those ideas? We either put them in the library or put them in our drawers or in our CDs. Nowadays, we are being pushed to see whether we can commercialize them. And you scientists are probably more exposed to this situation than we people from humanity and social science. But even us with huma from humanity and social science, especially in business, we are pushed to sell our ideas, commercialize our ideas. <coughs> so it's important, you know, I was talking about the danger to see higher education system just only from one perspective, you know. No, there is a need for diversity because there are different types of universities. You know, you've got the university depending on, 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 on on, on the center, on government, you got your uh, autonomous university, you got elitist universities, you know, there are few, but sometimes they are necessary. You got specialized universities, you got different forms of school, etc. So a healthy system, in my view, is a balanced system, is a system which is characterized by diversity. <coughs> so it is clear that nowadays we are, you know, we are being pushed. And I think both in developed and in developing countries, um, we are being pushed to move from the kind of one mission to the third mission, i.e., you know, because of economic reasons, resources, there is a problem of resources. Universities are being pushed to think about all the means of investment. In the UK, students now are paying their fees in order to run their business without having to wait for the, for the, the funding from, from, from the government. Um, in other countries, that model was not applied, but there are, you know, there, they are involved in some thinking about how to generate income in order to, uh, to, to be more aligned to their environment, but also to depend less from the public uh, purse. <coughs> And this really also means, which is good for research and teaching, this means that you know, we are pushed to develop stronger links with our economic and social environment. And I just thought I would probably take you to a few ideas, although I think I have, I have, I have addressed them, but you know, what is the entrepreneurial university? I am in favor of the entrepreneurial university as, as, as as far as uh, as long as we don't lose our soul, we don't really you know become just driven by by money. You know we need to make sure that the rigor is there, the theoretical basis is there, etc. But I think it's about time that everywhere we you know we try to move, not completely. Depending, each situation is unique, but we move towards you know uh, being entrepreneur. Maybe that entrepreneur may have a negative, uh, you know, uh, thing with it. But by entrepreneur, I mean being more linked to 
being more oriented towards the needs of, of your external environment and also you know try to commercialize what we produce and just leave it leave it leave it aside we have been producing a lot of ideas that you know industry or the society may find useful to apply and and buy so i think we have we have addressed all these things <coughs> what is important is actually to understand that to manage innovation at a macroeconomic level, at a national level, since the 1960s, governments have been using national system of innovation. Those national system of innovation are simply a group, uh, a group of institutions which are involved in the promotion, the development, the diffusion, the support of innovation being called better coordinated. So at the national level, we call it national system of innovation. At a, a, a regional level, and the regional concept of um, a regional system of innovation concept was developed, and I'm sure you would all recognize the idea, was developed after the success of Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley is a very good example of actually a regional system of innovation where you have universities being surrounded by a series of industry working at first at the regional level and trying to see how to promote innovation. So strong link between university, university and industry surrounding that university or created around the university to create innovation there. So <coughs> this system of, um, of uh, this, this uh, national system or regional systems consists of also different subsystems. Just giving you uh, an idea about how, what was their role and how, how the national system of innovation was defined, it was actually seen as, if you want, extremely important for developing innovation at the country level and therefore you know bringing growth and development but it's essentially if we want to kind of you know just get a, 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 a quick understanding about it it can be um, defined as consisting of two main spheres the most important sphere in the 60s was actually the industry, the structure of production. Because why it was seen as important, when we were talking about innovation at that time, we were only talking about industry. This sphere here, of which the education sector or the higher education sector is, is a member, was actually charged to bring, just develop, produce the idea, provide the funding, protect the idea, so you got the, f the funding institution, you got the legislative institution, and you got the higher education institution, the research institution to produce the idea, and it is applied there. It's only there, within the structure of production, within the industry, that we saw innovation, and innovation was actually associated with industry. Innovation was not happening here. This is, this is now being challenged. This being challenged, universities are being pushed to also play a role. And especially, I'm sure you've got all in your universities, ideas which have been captured, used, exploited by universities to develop their own business, business incubators, etc. So, but it's, it's a first move. But what we are doing here, we are actually moving from the division of work because here it was a very clear division. Here the idea is produced, protected, funded, etc., and it's applied there within within the, the, the industry. For our research, or for my research to some extent, I am very much interested by actually the subsystems. Because I want to come back to, to knowledge creation. I want to come back to uh, understand better 
the, uh, the role of, of the knowledge creation. So the way I've also organized this, this, this talk, I, you know, in terms of case studies, I have decided to you know, uh, use some of the research that I have uh, conducted on, my, with my, uh, on, on myself or with a few colleagues to you give you some kind of um, examples. It's true that you know, these, these subsystems within the higher education system are, are recognized. And the role of, when we talk about the role, when we have been talking, probably, I hope so, when we have been talking about the role of innovation, uh, the role of university in the production of innovation, we have essentially, essentially, if not only, been thinking about the impact of research on innovation. And I'm proud to say that actually we decided with another Algerian colleague and a, a British colleague, we decided to look at the link between education and teaching and innovation. We couldn't find any article. So far, I couldn't find any article. However, I've sent the paper before submitting it to a colleague who is, who is now retired, uh, who's been working for many decades on innovation. He was at Sussex and then moved to Glasgow and then worked in Africa, etc. He was very critical. He said, no, there are other papers which exist and this is not original. But I couldn't find any evidence. Another colleague who I asked to review it liked it. We submitted. I wanted, because we are all kind of um, move, pushed and sometimes driven by, you know, driven by the idea of publishing with high-ranking journal. My first idea was to publish it with a four-star journal. But because of that reluctance, I decided to put it on a three-star journal. And I was very surprised that it was actually accepted with very minor modification. And what we have actually shown, we have shown the strong link for the first time between teaching the impact that teaching had on, on, on the innovation. Initially, that's the, the, the research that we've done, and it's published on the, in, the, in the Journal of Higher Education Studies. Initially, we were thinking about actually doing it at an international, well, it's still an international level, but we wanted to have developing countries in the sample of countries that we were looking at. You know, we looked at, we used different databases. But with time, we had to remove all the developing countries because of the missing data. So the results are very relevant to countries from the OCDE, the developed countries. And actually, where teaching is perceived as strong, high quality, it has an impact. On innovation. So those countries which have good teaching, high quality teaching, successful teaching are very innovative. But we looked also at other things. Here are the hypotheses that we looked at. We, you know, we looked at the access because the access is important for me when I think about Algeria. Sometimes I wonder, you may not agree with me, we may, we may need, needed that in 60s in the 60s and 70s because the level of educated people in Algeria was very low. But at this day now, I do wonder whether we need millions of students, millions of future unemployed people. And I like to, okay, I like to see probably the university being probably more kind of selective in order to produce more. So the equity is the access, opening the access to everybody. We also looked at the funding. And we also looked at this kind of first mission, ivory tower, knowledge in general, theoretical knowledge versus application driven. Equity, access, 
it is actually uh, seen as important for innovation. But that equity needs to come with quality. Otherwise, it doesn't lead to innovation. Funding, funding, significantly important. But we found some interesting. And I was talking to, to sorry, I forgot your name, but we were talking. We found actually that funding is important. It doesn't matter where the money comes from. However, so it's private or public. However, the private is linked to patent. The public is linked to publications. You need a combination. You need a trade-off. Here, there was no one type of knowledge being more important than the other. Both of them are important. There was no significantly kind of important, neither for the ivory tower nor for the application. Both of them need to be linked. This takes us to probably think about <coughs> the context of, of Algeria. We have spent a lot of money, but the results are not very good. And I think you are quite familiar. We have spent a lot of money, but the results are not very good. The first project, we, we wanted to kind of try to see what are you know, what are the problems with the Algerian University? We, we developed this framework. We used the status laissez-faire hybrid. We wanted to see where the Algerian University is and are they operating at the local, are they operating at the national level? That was a comparative study with India, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Take you to the results. You can see that Algeria is actually most of the university are concentrated at the left. It's essentially at the national level, uh, not spread uh, uh, you know, throughout the kind of moving into the laissez-faire. It's hybrid and national, not into laissez-faire, not in the hybrid. Comparing to India, India which is well spread. So that was the first those are kind of, you know, the, the, the recommendations saying we need to spray it over. Just take you probably into the, that what, you know, what we have to think about. There is, you know, the ideal situation is, okay, you want to, f to, to, to provide a whole high coverage in terms of many disciplines, many universities, many programs, etc. Fine, if you can afford it. It's a problem when you do that without having enough resources, it affects the quality. It's great if you can have as many access as possible. It's good, it's tremendous, but can you pay for it? If you can't, it has an impact of, on, on, on quality. <coughs> and the third uh, a project is, is really, it's ongoing now, it's ongoing. Uh, I'll take you through to the findings, and then I shut up. Um, yeah, I think for a, ch for a change, I mean, you know, we assumed that the level of collaboration we did, uh, we had about nearly 600 replies, but we had to push. But we had about 600 replies. Uh, and this was ongoing, but this was based on the pilot study. So we had seen some differences between, for instance, the center, the west, the east, and the south because of the pilot study. But I think we have addressed that. But the initial findings, uh, two-thirds of our sample respondents confirmed that their institution has had some form of collaboration with the economic and social sector. To cut the story short, most of the collaboration is actually around teaching and education. And I see no problem with Algeria actually putting a greater emphasis on actually teaching and education in order to probably form, you know, in order to produce good researchers, good managers, good creatives, etc. So there is no problem, you know, in terms of putting more money on teaching in order to ensure the quality of your human capital and the human skills, rather than trying to do several things and not succeeding in most of them. This is my, uh, you know, the, my conclusion in terms of, you know, what, um, what can, what needs to be done. I think the quality of teaching is extremely important. 
It's extremely important. We cannot be productive in terms of research, and we cannot be productive in different areas if we, if the quality is not there. And I'll leave that and probably move to the last one. I also think, and you know, people have been talking about it, but we haven't seen a lot of things. The diaspora can be better used. You know, imagine each one of, all, of us pushing and trying to have a co-author from Algeria as but not as a free rider. No. If if you know if this colleague you know delivers that can have a significant impact on the ranking of their universities. But we are not there yet. And I don't think it's your fault and I don't think it's my fault because we have all tried and failed. I'll stop here and probably take a question. Too.